So here we are today for another episode of Words with Friends, where I talk about a word with one of my friends. Today, we have the legend that is Jeffrey Shaw. Jeffrey, welcome to the show. Hey, Phil. It's great to have some time with you. I, I love what you're doing here. I think it's a great concept, by the way. Well, it's huge fun, right? Just to talk about one word. And so that anybody isn't wondering what it is we're talking about today, we are talking about the word of empathy. And in your world, you're a business coach, a consultant, a um, or recovering photographer, perhaps even that thing too. Um, where does empathy fit into your world? It's everything. Like to me, it's, it's the way to be in business today. I, I could even say it's probably, you know, there's two ways of looking at this, Phil, as you know. Like I'm such a, I've got such a business brain. Well, even the tagline on my podcast, Creative Wars, the tagline is business for the soul, right? So I can, I can, I can do the woo-woo dance with anyone. But at the same time, I've got a really good business brain. So I love to talk about empathy and the soft side of it and, and how it's the right way to be in the world. But you know what, Phil? It's also, I believe, one of your best leverage points in business today. Like I think it is the marketing tool in business today. Um, and I, that's what I love about it. I love the fact that it's, it's both soulful and it's effective. And that to me is the secret of success. I don't think it's an either, I don't think success is an either or. I don't think we either have to choose to, to succeed. You know, I don't think we have to choose to be financially successful and a jerk or be really soulful, but be a starving artist. I, I don't think we have to choose. And I think a word like empathy kind of fits squarely in between and lets us be both. Okay. So for this fear of not wanting to be woo woo, using your words, like help us understand what is meant by the words empathy or what does it mean to you? So to me, it was pretty aligned with the clinical definition, if you will, is that empathy is the ability to identify with someone else's feelings, thoughts, and attitudes, right? So it's, it's the ability to identify very different than sympathy, right? And I have to say, you know, some people collapse those two, they're entirely different, right? Sympathy is to, to have sorrow for someone else where empathy is to, you know, identify, I, it was what stood out to me when, I, when in looking at the clinical definition of empathy, the, the word identify would use. And I like that. Um, I would say it's even share, right? So it's one thing to identify, but true empathy to me is to some degree to share the similar feelings, attitudes and uh, of someone else. But it's not to say you have to adopt them. And I think that's important too. Okay. Right. So where are there some examples like in day-to-day -day life where you observe or witness other people maybe getting empathy wrong, maybe not having empathy? <sighs> Gosh, I, I'm challenged to say that I think a lot of people get it wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, again, my world is in business and, you know, we're speaking in the middle of my work days so and my brain is in full business gear. And I think this is a huge problem in business. I think most businesses don't have empathy for their business, right? They're, they're out to execute. <laughs> they're out to execute an action plan or to execute their product or service that they're offering. Um, and not having empathy, and my point is, is if they had empathy, I believe they would gain greater devotion and retention amongst their clients, their customers. So unfortunately, I think a lot of customers, you know, so I'll give you, let's talk about one specific brand, TD right. Bank, okay? I was absolutely intrigued with TD Bank and is it okay to like pick on a brand here? Yeah, let's do it. We are just two <laughs> friends forum. talking about empathy, right? Yeah. I don't want to get sued or lose. All, I'll have all my accounts shut down at TD Bank because I am a customer. But, you know, I had, I had such respect for their initial ad campaign. I thought they were so cool. I thought they had a different perspective. They were all about like not having the velvet rope lines that you stand behind. Uh, they made fun of the pens that were chained down. They had hours that were realistic, like they made fun of banks closing at five o'clock when it's exactly when their ideal customer, entrepreneurs and small businesses, that's when they actually finished working at, at best and then would go to the bank. Like they made fun of everything traditional we knew about banking. I thought they were spot on. I loved it. I became a customer because I, liked to, I wanted to support their mission. And now I'm a customer and they don't live up to the promise. Like they have, their technology is so behind in so many ways. They don't, they actually don't have empathy and it drives me crazy. It's like, I feel like their marketing team did a really good job. Maybe their marketing team had empathy, but at best I think they had cleverness because when you actually get into the business, I don't think, I don't think they did the work to really walk in my shoes as a customer because they have their technologies behind 
and they have some really weird policies. I, I went recently, my, my mom was redoing her will and I just needed something notarized. And they couldn't notarize something that was associated with a will. But I was able to walk down to Chase Bank down the street and they were able to do it. Like I'm a customer of this bank and you can't notarize this because that's in some way attached to a will and that's a policy in their business, okay. right? So I, unfortunately I see a lot of businesses either not put the effort into empathy or they talk a good talk, but they don't walk their talk. And I, and I agree with you there. Is there's, there's dozens of examples where people say they do something, but then don't necessarily follow through with that belief. And it's not just in the world of business, right? It happens with people, I guess. Yeah. And any given time, like somebody would give a, themselves a fine reputation to live up to, but then don't follow through on, on those kind of promises. And you and I both speak for a living. Yep. We hear a lot of times people comment of their one thing on the stage, but not necessarily the same when they're off the stage. Yeah. And look at the work you do, as I know you do, to, to get the perspective, which to me, empathy and, and, and knowing one's perspective are so closely related. Right. You go through great effort to understand the perspective, which to me is an act of empathy to, under, to understand the perspective of the audience you're going to be speaking in front of. Right. I know that you and all awesome speakers take that extra step to do that so that you can, you can adapt your keynote with empathy to share the perspective. Now, and I think it's important also, fellas, I noted a minute ago, like sharing or identifying in an empathetic way does not mean you have to ad adapt or adopt is a better way to say, adopt that attitude, right? It's not agreement. This, we see this in our personal relationships. I mean, it, hey, you're, you're married. I, I've been in and out of a few relationships. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, what's important is that, you know, it's important in an intimate relationship as it is in business to have empathy, have an understanding of someone else's perspective. It, there's no way in any relationship you're always going to agree or ad adopt that attitude. But man, if you want that relationship to last, you better at least have an understanding of an empathetic understanding of that person's perspective. And, and by empathy in that scenario, I guess you mean genuinely being able to see it from the other person's point of view. Correct. See it, it doesn't mean you have to agree with it, but the empathetic act is to say, I can see how you're seeing it that way. Okay. Start with that. And not even necessarily disagree with it. It's just to accept that that's the way that you're seeing it and you see yeah. the world differently to what I see. Yeah. I, I, I would guess that I, this is totally, you know, my, my, my guess and ex experiential uh, feeling on this, that I, I think what blocks a lot of people is assumptions and judgments. Right. right? Um, give a little context here. So as you know, as a photographer, for 30 years, I ended up photographing the wealthiest people in the United States. I mean, that's, I carved out that space for myself. I was a family photographer for very wealthy families. Now, I grew up lower middle class at best and heard every stereotype about rich people you can imagine, right? The kids are raised by nannies. So they're, they have all the money in the world, but they're not really happy. Yeah. I remember my mom saying once something about, you know, well, there's a lot of rich people that actually stand in lines at soup kitchens, but they go to the back door because they don't want anybody to know. I'm like, where did she get this information? <laughs> you know, so that stuff can greatly alter your perspective and your ability to be empathetic for people you don't know. Thankfully, for whatever reason, I think for me, it made me insanely curious and non-judgmental. So when I started working with this clientele, by the way, all those stereotypes I found out to be wrong, you know, what could easily be a block would be if you're coming into your relationship building with someone and you're, you're, you have assumptions, or you're making judgments about them. That to me is the block of the ability to be empathetic. Okay. So this non-judgmental attitude is, is the thing that I'm hearing coming through on, on so much of this is that we can have more empathy if we stop trying to put people in boxes or we stop trying to say that, you know, that all of those people are like all of that thing. Right. It, it's actually truly taking the time or the curiosity to use your words to, to kind of peel back some layers and find out what's really true. Well, look what's going on now with millennials, right? I mean, it's amazing to me when I, the com content put online and the conversations I hear about people, but just broadcasting broad statements about millennials. <laughs> right. And I've got three and I think that they're a fascinating generation, but the, the one that kills me is all millennials are entitled. I'm like, really? To me, they're the first generation to have the balls to not settle. 
<laughs> and I think even in all of those comments, though, is, is that when we talk empathy, you know, I was having a conversation in a line at, um, waiting for a plane. I do that a little bit too often. And, uh, you know, the person in the line was, was having their rant about millennials and this same entitled thing came out, etc. And, and in that very moment, I said, you do realize my date of birth puts me at the very extremity of, of being a millennial. Wow. So, so am I entitled? Yeah. It's, again, you can only, that perspective of millennials are entitled, I believe, are coming from the perspective of the baby boomers. And sorry, I'm, on, I'm the last year of the baby boomer generation, 1964. So I, I'm also on the extremity of the generation. And I believe that attitude that millennials are entitled is coming from this, you know, older person's perspective, this baby boomer's perspective. I think there's a little jealousy in there, right? I actually think there's a little, because again, like I said, I think the millennial generation is the first generation to have the audacity to not settle, right? Our parents' generation settled on everything and God bless them. I mean, very noble generation. They, they stayed in jobs that made them miserable, but it brought a paycheck. They stayed in relationships because divorce wasn't accepted. Our generation, I, call, I refer to my generation anyway, kind of the later baby boomers, I kind of call us the sandwich generation because we were initially raised with the values of the generation before us, but we got halfway through our lives. And I'm like, we're like, this isn't panning out for me. Like I want more out of life than this. And the, the millennials, I think are the first generation to the whole YOLO thing. Like, Hey, we only live once. Right. We might as well make it awesome. But there's surely there's risks involved here too, of, of even talking about groups of people and then, and, and then suggesting that everybody that falls into that group of people behaves in a certain way, because Absolutely. my belief would be that in every generation, there are people that are entitled, people that are hardworking, people that are go-getters, people that have prepared to work hard, people that, you know, have love and compassion in their hearts. Yeah. And age or date of birth has, has zero like impact or effect on, on where those things are. So, how do we get to be more empathetic in our lives? How do we get to have more empathy? If, if I'm listening to this right now and I'm thinking, hey, you know, I, I'd like to have more empathy. I, you know, I do care. I say that I care. But perhaps there are too many examples in my own mind where I have that level of judgment. How do I make moves to, to, to find more empathy in my life? Um, you know, I, th I would say gain as many perspectives as you can in your life, which means to me, live as diversified a life as you can. Right? It's hard to have empathy for the other if you only know a small sliver of existence. Um, so, you know, some, before I wrote my book, somebody offered me a really confrontational question, but thankfully I, I didn't take it as confrontational, but I was in a mastermind and another member of the mastermind said, what gives you the authority to write this book? Right. Right. And I loved the question actually, because at first, it did hit me a little confrontational because I immediately collapsed under my own insecurities that I don't have a PhD, I don't have a college, you know, I don't have a big <laughs> degree. You know. you know, as soon as you hear authority, I'm thinking, what does give me the authority? And, and actually, my real quick response was, I've lived on the opposite sides of many fences, right? I grew up lower middle class, served the wealthiest people. I suffered terrible, terrible uh, paralyzing shyness until my mid-20s, and now, bigger the stage, the better. Uh, I, I was straight as a straight man up to the age of 44, came out as a gay man at 44, right? That gives you a, believe me, <laughs> all those changes in life give you the ability to have empathy for others because you've walked in a lot of other people's shoes. So I think the best thing you can do is live a diversified life. I, I live in Miami Beach, which is predominantly Latin. And it's one of the things I love about being here because I'm the minority, right? Middle-aged white man, like I'm so the minority down here. Um, I love the fact that, I, and I don't speak Spanish, I love the fact that it's, it's, I'm the odd one out, right? Because I love putting myself in situations, continually putting myself in situations where there is diversity because that enables you to have empathy. And I, I think it's one of the, it's, it's causing our world a whole lot of problems right now to not allow more diversity, right? Right. Um, the whole idea of shutting down borders scares the daylights out of me because it's like you want you we want to get to know people unlike ourselves to expand our ability to have empathy. So we're we talking about like a like a quest for understanding. Is 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 that what empathy is? Is it like this relentless ability to say no, 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 no let me let me understand your point of view. Let me understand where you're coming from. Is is that? 
Is that the Great effort? Question. Effort you know, I guess what's, what's, what, what, you know, again, I, what I love about your whole concept here is you and I, and I, I think probably a lot of people, we could, we could pick apart one day at a, one word at a time. The word understanding has me a little hung up on that because, again, I don't want under, to understand someone else's point of view. I don't want that to collapse into agreement. Ah. Right? It, 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 to say you understand someone's point of view does not mean you have to agree with it, but it is having empathy. Can you, if you were they standing in their shoes, could you at least come to a level of understanding as to how they formed their opinion or where they're coming from? Right. Right. Um, so it's a transference almost. Okay. And I guess in, a, in like as polarized a world as we currently live in, the ability to have more of this could be kind of useful, right? Where, where might this help? Um, I, I think, you know, look at the feuding between religions. I mean, you could break it down in so many ways. It, it really is rooted to me in a lack of understanding how they formed that opinion. As extreme as that opinion might be, can we take the time to understand the formation of that, the historical accumulation of information that led to that perspective? Because if you could at least empathize again you may not agree i don't i may not agree, and i certainly don't agree with the way you know s some people express their beliefs but man it's valuable to at least have an understanding and i think i think there's a hope i don't want to be too global about it but i think there could be a hope for world peace if we had more empathy for one another more like hey i accept your point of view i don't I may not agree with it i don't like the way you execute it but I get it. Okay. I think that's valuable. And strange things that it is, is the word itself, it doesn't get used very often. It doesn't get talked about. It isn't something that's like a hot topic buzzword. It's not like innovation or influence or, you know, these words that get thrown around at every conference we attend. But there isn't, our theme this year is empathy. What, why is empathy not sexy? Wow. Well, let's bring, let's, let's, let's bring it back to being sexy. Um, and that's what you're doing. That's what the point of your show. Um, you know, I'm always amazed at how often when I talk about empathy, people somehow collapse it into sympathy. And yet they're worlds apart in meaning, really. So I think there's just a, uh, because of the lack of conversation around empathy, which I do think is increasing. Um, on my podcast, I've had a couple of guests that had, in one way or another have brought up the topic of empathy. Um, even actually one of my own coaching clients uh, through my digging in and, and, and trying to get to her core perspective and her core message, um, I came up with the terminology empathetic intelligence. Right. And I quickly Googled it and found that's not a, uh, that's, that term is used, <laughs> which to me is a good thing. It's not like it doesn't exist. I didn't know if empathetic intelligence would even exist as a term. And what I found is it does exist. So I actually, that excites me because you know, this way, this, my client, my coaching client can kind of jump on the bandwagon of something that already exists as opposed to breaking new ground. But we, we have emotional intelligence. Uh, we talk, we talk about emotional intelligence. We talk, don't, we talk about, you know, uh, smart book intelligence, but we don't talk about empathetic intelligence. I actually think this is a new thing. And this is where I'm guiding my coaching clients. Like, I think there's a whole model around bringing the idea of empathetic intelligence to light because I think while many of us can, by the way, I just want a sidebar here. I just said, I think, I'm trying so hard to change it in my life <laughs> one word at a time. I wanna say I believe, because it has more commitment to it. Um, so I believe that empathetic intelligence can be and should be a much bigger part of our conversation and moving forward. I think we may, I, I believe we, we may come into the world at different levels of empathy, but it's a learned, it's a learned skill as well. We can learn to be more empathetic. Okay. Now we live in a world right now where people are almost challenged, pushed, pressured to, to hustle, to grind, to achieve, to be a big self achiever, to win, to be a winner, etc. And in some ways, doesn't that create a conflict to empathy when you know, winning might in some ways create a position of isolation or selfishness? Great question. Um, first of all, I don't think it's an either or. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that, that, although it's very preliminary in thought, I'm pretty sure my next book is gonna be about paradoxes. 
Um, I love paradox. Like I'm fascinated by them. <laughs> we live in such a black and white world, but um, I, I used to use a quote on a previous blog of mine that went something like clarity is the fearless union of conflicting ideas. Right. right. I didn't know I was talking about paradox when I wrote that all those years ago, but that's exactly it. It's like, what's the sweet spot in, in between? Because yes, if, if there's a way of being in the world and being in a business in a way that lacks empathy, that might get you to where you want to go for a while. Right. Um, I, we see plenty of companies brought down by the eventual exposure of their lack of empathy. Right. Um, to me, you know, that was what happened to Uber former CEO came out with a very strong political stance against immigration and, you know, not having empathy for the fact that a good part, part of a good uh, percentage of Uber drivers are immigrants. Right. right. So it was such a break in empathy that millions of people couldn't tolerate and abandon the app. And I was certainly one of the first in line to like, that's out of alignment for me and my values and what I think the values of the company is how it's aligned with their drivers. So I stopped using them. Okay. And they did. They lost millions of subscribers. They're, they're doing okay, but they lost a lot of uh, brand loyalty in, in that event. I mean, well, one of the reasons I picked you to want to talk about this word is, is when I stumbled across this, your, you know, your, your book Lingo, right? Which is, is fundamentally a business book. And its subtitle is to, to discover the ideal customers, your ideal customer's secret language and make your business irresistible. And it sounds like a typical kind of business book. And, and, and I was reading through it, getting some great ideas and some great strategies for me and for some of my clients. But the one underlying feeling that I could get through it was this you have to care about what the people you care about care about. And then that very thought reminded me of me being in the audience of, of another great speaker, a guy called John Acuff. And John Acuff gave the definition of empathy as, well, what empathy is, is caring about what the people you care about care about. Yeah. Now that sounds like super fluffy, right? It sounds like, yeah, but what? Uh, like take your Uber scenario right now, what we're looking at is we're looking at saying, well, actually you should care about all of your stakeholders, drivers, customers, consumers, potential future customers. In fact, everybody who could be one, therefore any level of discrimination or failing to care about what those people may go on to care about could result in adverse effects. In your book here though, you're saying that one of the things that we have to have an understanding on if we, if we want to discover our ideal customer's secret language, we've got to get inside their head. Right. How, how do we do that? How do we think more like our consumers as opposed to just say that we think? Because I read on websites every day, like we pride ourselves on our customer service and other nonsensical sets of words. Yeah. Um, how do we physically do this? Because I think when pushed, if we are somebody of like, do you have empathy? The answer is, well, yes, of course. And do you see yourself as, self as empathetic? Well, yes, of course I do. Yeah. Yet we're still seeing a huge shortage of it being demonstrated in the real world. So, so how do I go about having more of this? What might be some steps I could take even in a business context yeah. that would allow me to go out and amp up my empathy a touch? Cool. Well, and it's for the very reason of writing the book that the word empathy really became important to me because, you know, as you said, the subtitle, discover your ideal customer's secret language. As soon as I started referring to it as a secret language, which was my experience when I kind of unearthed this fantastic marketing strategy 30 years ago, you know, and I referred to it as a secret language by the mere fact it was called a secret language. My concern in writing the book is that people were going to see this as uh, manipulative. So my editor, in her wonderful wisdom had said to me, she wanted me to make, before I wrote the book, I made a list of objections, right? What are all the things somebody could object to in the reading of this book before I wrote it? So I understood, so I could address those potential objections. And my, the number one fear for me is that people were going to interpret this marketing and branding book as being clever, as being um, manipulative because you were getting into psychographics. Right? You're getting into somebody's mindset and their headspace. And I was afraid that I would be interpreted as somebody that supported that type of manipulation. Right. So I had to answer for myself. I had to answer the import, you know, how, how that was not the case. And what I realized is it's coming from a place of empathy. Right? It's not coming from a place of being clever or manipulative. It's coming from a true effort of empathy. So one of the things, uh, one, there, there are, 
there are five strategic steps I offer in the book uh, that I refer to as the five steps of developing the secret language. Number one is perspective, right? You just, to me, you just can't move past go until you have literally stood in the shoes of your ideal customer. Which, what's so important about this is that it's probably not who you are today, right? Um, most businesses are serving people with a product or a service, their ideal customer is not necessarily who they are today. Because they may have, for example, they may be solving a problem that they've grown away from and they created something that solves that problem. So they're no longer the person with the problem. But right. can you have empathy for the person who's still experiencing that problem for which you have a solution, right? So we're always, I believe, as creators and entrepreneurs, we're always typically a shift away from those we're serving. In a lot of, just like we're talking about millennials, right? You might be creating something to serve the millennials, but you're no longer a millennial yourself. So you're just a shift away. So it's imperative you understand their perspective in a non-judgmental, non you know, without assumption sort of way. Um, and another specific example, which I think is extremely powerful, I talk about it in the book, is understanding the deeper need of your ideal customer. This to me is the most empathetic act because the deeper need is knowing what your ideal customer wants that they don't know to ask for, All right? Now think about this in your personal relationships. If, you know, and I know you're, you're a married guy, is it not true that when you do something for your wife that has, it makes a big impression on her that she didn't even know to ask for, but you were a step ahead of her. Is that not the biggest home run in a relationship? It's like the greatest of wins. <laughs> Absolutely. And to know what that is. And, and by the way, I, I, to tie this in for those that are familiar with the book, the five love languages, I, I make, I, I honor the, the book five love languages in my book because that was foundational to me as a parent in the early nineties when I read that book. And it, cause I had three kids. I still have three kids. I had three kids at the time and really each of them had a different love language. And I realized I was trying to parent them off with one language, the language that was comfortable <laughs> with me, but they were three different languages. And when I, after reading that book, I realized that I needed to speak to them a little differently in order to make them feel loved. In business, we're sort of talking about that. That to me is what empathy is. Empathy is a love language where you are stepping up and, and finding out what the deeper need of your customers that they don't know to ask for, but touches them deeply when you accomplish something for them a step ahead of their even asking for it. I love that though. Empathy is a love language. Language. What a, what a cool way of looking at it and, and looking for a deeper need. So when you're talking perspective, it isn't just what does it look like from their point of view, it's what does it feel like, feel like. Yeah. from their so point of view. Can I give you a specific example of my own? Of my own? Yeah. So as a photographer, right? So the, I, I separate the two by the acknowledged need and deeper need. So there's an acknowledged need. People have an acknowledged need when they reach out to a photographer. They want photographs to hang on their wall. They want holiday cards. They, you know, there's a specific acknowledged need. Um, I always brush that. I, I pay, I listen to people's acknowledged need. I'm like, that's what, you know, I, there was a joke in my business. I had a staff of like four or five in, in the back room and I would often go in the back room. It's like, yeah, I'm going to give them what they, you know, I'm going to give them, how do I say, uh, how do I say it? It was so curt. I would say, I'm going to, I'm going to ignore what they think they want. I'm going to give them what I want to give them. Right. And it sounds obnoxious, but the fact of the matter is I was so committed to give to giving their deeper need. I paid it, I it almost brushed off what they, their acknowledged need. Yeah, I want photographs of my family. Yeah, that's what they want. I wanted to stop them in their tracks every time they walked down the hallway and brought tears to their eyes. Wow. Nobody ever contacted me and said, Jeff, I'd like, you, I'd like you to make me cry when I look at photographs of my children five years from now. They just wanted something in that moment. I had a deeper need for them and I, I stayed committed to that. I also came to understand with this affluent clientele that I served that their deeper need that no one would ever know to ask for, my role to them was to, to help them be responsible parents. Because when you, here's what I had to learn when I understood their perspective. When you have money, money is no longer an excuse. Right. right? So they can't Ivy League two of their kids and send the third one to community college. <laughs> it's not an excuse. You can't, in the same, with regards to being a photographer, there was no excuse to them to have tons of photographs of the first child and nothing of the, the second and third child, right. right? 
So I upheld a standard to help my, kid, my, my clients be incredibly responsible in their lives. I made sure that all their kids were photographed at the same time of their lives, that each child had the same number of photographs on display. So no child would ever have to say, hey, how can there's you know, more photographs of my older brother than me? Right. Right. So because at their heart, I felt their deepest need was to show up in the world and be able to turn to their kids and feel like they were the most responsible parents they could be. That, that's, that was their highest value. And there's examples of this deeper need thing that exists in, in dozens of other areas, right? So even Steve Jobs, right? Steve Jobs was famous for saying, it's not my customer's responsibility. I'm getting an echo back here right now. Are you getting an echo? No, I'm not, no. Okay, we're gonna run on regardless. So he would say that it's not my customer's responsibility to know what they want. And Henry Ford was famous to say that if I listen to my customers, I'd have tried to make a faster horse. Exactly. And, and I think sometimes the, the empathy can be all about the heart, but sometimes it's about the head, right? Is, is that where we're getting to here as well? Is, is there some logic here and there's some emotion, but it's the blending of the two. Right. I think it kind of goes hand in hand, right? There's a, there's, a, there's a feeling of their emotions and there's a commitment to doing what you know is best for them. But a that's what head comes in. It's, there's, a commit, there's a level of commitment. A while ago, though, you talked about this as a marketing strategy. And the very challenge of, of marketing strategy as a set of words would suggest that this is for your benefit. Yeah. Well, and there's, a, there's an irony attached to that, right? Yeah. Well, as I said, I mean, you could get twisted. I am, I'm so particular <laughs> about words in my business. Like we don't, I don't allow the terminology of marketing funnel in my business. Um, we don't talk about marketing to customers. We, we refer in our business, we refer to it as how do we invite and enroll people into our world? Right. Um, and I don't use a model of marketing funnel. I use a model of concentric circles because I want to take people from the outer rings of those circles and continually bring them a circle closer until they, where do they end up at the core? They end up at the center. You're going to say the center of the heart. It just visually. So any, you know, sales, uh, what one would normally call a sales funnel, marketing funnel, uh, online sequences. If you were to see, and my, my office is decorated with a lot of hand drawn charts all over the walls. Um, they're all circular. Right? It's because I want it to embrace the overall feeling of what it means to bring people closer to me, not squeezing them through a small hole, which is what a funnel represents. Right? So I'm very picky about the, the usage of, of, of words. Um, so yeah, you can get kind of twisted. But again, I think the, um, if, the act, if your act of empathy is clean, I actually think, I, actually, I wrote an article years ago for Huffington Post on whether you show up salesy or committed. Right. I think you have a tremendous amount of latitude when your, your empathy is clean, when your understand your desire to understand someone from an empathetic point of view, when it's clean, I think you actually gain latitude to show up pretty aggressively committed and it will feel committed to their betterment than salesy. Right. I like You're that. a sales guy. You know how that feels, right? There's a big difference. Like somebody can show up salesy and feel really salesy. Somebody can show up aggressively selling themselves in a way, but it feels completely committed to your well-being and energetically feels entirely different. Because it's committed to purpose, because it's exactly. laced in care. Correct. It's laced in empathy. <laughs> and you could say that empathy is to show that you care. You could say that it's to say that you care, but it's probably to do nothing more than to just care, right? It's yeah. about being a decent human. Yeah. And, and, you know, as you said it, it, a moment ago, as you set up this question that, why did I say in the beginning, I think this is the most important marketing leveraging tool we have today is because, you know, the conversation on marketing for years now has been buyer personas and avatars and demographics and behavior. All great. You know, I'm grateful those things got us to where we are. I just don't think it's enough. Like I think people are going to re in the future are going to require more than you knowing their stats or even their behaviors. And for that matter, even a, a, a general profile at the end of the day. And I say this repeatedly in my book lingo, I say repeatedly what people need to feel which comes from, I believe, a place of empathy. They need to feel like you get them. When people feel like, man, this business, this brand gets me, you can charge a premium price because people will, will, will almost throw their criteria of expense out the window 
for the value of feeling like this person gets me. You get me. Got it. And we come back around to something I do with all of my speeches, which is to, well, genuinely, my goal in the first 90 seconds of any speech I get is that every audience member can say in their mind's eye, he gets me. Yes. So my goal is to achieve the show me, you know me criteria. Yeah. That, that's what I'm looking for is Love to that. get them from unfolded to open is yeah. he gets me. Yeah. So that's, that's the goal we're looking for. And I guess, you know, as I'm scribbling notes here, listening to you right now is the most beautiful thing about putting effort into empathy is you don't need another strategy. You don't need to have to make up a new one next month. It's not about having the next thing. And, and neither do you need to look over your shoulder and think, well, what did I do? What do I need to you know, repeat? What? You, you can't mess it up, really. Yeah. And even when you do, people let you off. Yeah, and that's the crazy thing. That's what I'm saying. Like, the whole goal of, you know, I should say the whole goal, but certainly the big goal of my writing lingo was I want businesses to work with their ideal customers because I have determined, in my opinion, it is the fastest route to a successful and fulfilling life. Like to not clutter up your life by just taking whatever work can come along, but to really do the work, the empathetic work of understanding the perspective and lifestyle of your ideal customer and then build a business that speaks to them, right? So the result of that is, as you had just said, it, it is amazing how easy business becomes we as we as humans we seem to be wired for hard <laughs> <laughs> right right and if you take the time to have an empathetic understanding of your ideal customers you speak their secret language you build a brand that communicates that it is amazing how easy it is for people to show up and and they show up aligned heart to heart with your value system with what you believe and you and, and again Another reason why this is such an important tool is together you create value greater than the expectation of either of party. Because when you put two huge forces coming together, you and your customer, those two forces come together with a foundation of empathy and a desire to create exceptional value, you're going to raise the bar. Gotcha. And, and as you know, I just recently gave a TEDx talk and that's how my TEDx talk actually ties into this is because we can only achieve the levels of greatness in our own lives to the, to the degree of the boundaries, if you will, of our own predetermined expectations. Right. Right. The way to, for us to raise the higher levels is to surround ourselves with people who see more in us than we see in ourselves. And when you have empathy for your ideal customers, your ideal customers show up in your world. They see more in you than you might see in yourself. Next thing you know, everybody's rising up. It's a beautiful thing, Phil. It's like life made easy. It's life made easy. And I, and I think that's where I kind of want to try and wrap this back round for people listening in is, is there is nothing that we've talked about today that I, I don't think people will have agreement on. If they're listening in on our conversation, they'd be like, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yet it's still so overwhelming. Yeah. So I'm going to throw you a challenge with absolutely no preparation. This is words with friends. There's no script here is I want you to come up with, or let's see what we can do together. Some form of affirmation or mantra or something that people can perhaps look to, to memorize, think about, stick it on a fridge magnet, write it on their wall, stick it in the diary that helps them live life with a touch more empathy. What, what could that be? A handful of words. Well, okay, let me see if this works for you because this is my morning affirmation. And, and I, I, by the way, the, the last third of lingo is kind of a self-help book. You know, I mean, the last <laughs> part of it is about daily practices and mindsets. And one of the things I speak about are affirmations. You know, which, hey, we talk about a lot in the world in affirmations, but I don't, people don't stick to them. I, I look at affirm, people stick with affirmations like they stick to, uh, you know, antibiotics. Like the doctor tells you, you got to see the bottle of antibiotics through, through to the end or you're going to get the virus back. Well, affirmations are the same thing. People stick with it to a degree. And then when it starts working, they stop doing them. So my affirmation, which I think I never, I never thought about it being have an empathetic flavor to it, but my morning affirmation currently, which has been for several months now, and this is actually really personal. I can't believe I'm sharing this. This is, this is my own affirmation in my head. But I repeat this re as I'm walking my dogs for 45 minutes in the morning. In the back of my mind, I am saying to myself, I am loved and acknowledged by a world that I love and acknowledge. I am loved and acknowledged by a world that I love and acknowledge. Right. 
because I am the first one to say that I, you know, I, my biggest hang up in my own success is feeling invisible. And boy, we could have a whole therapy session as to why that is, but <laughs> you know, and I do understand why, but I, I feel like I can, I can work really hard, wave my hands in the air, you know, loud and high. And, and I just seem to be invisible, right? That's my hang up in life. And what I realize is I need this affirmation, but it's not a one way street. Right? I can't just say, I want to be loved and acknowledged. Of course I do. I want to be loved. I want to be acknowledged for the work I do. I do. But it's not a one-way street. It only comes in return for me having love and acknowledged for the world around me. And I realized that's a, that's a, that, was a, that was, I believe, the holdup because I'm, I'm at my essence a pretty shy person. And you, know, you can't go through work, the life not loving the people around you, having empathy for them. You can't go through life without acknowledging the beautiful day and the people around you and expect to be acknowledged in return. Right. So to me, it ties into, that is my mantra for empathy because I, it, the act of acknowledging and loving others and having empathy allows me to believe and trust that I will get all that I need and fulfill my life and heart in return. That's beautiful. Jeff, I have a question for you really before we get into my final question. It's um, I'm guessing we've, piqued some curiosity about the world of Jeffrey Shaw. And I'm guessing people that have been a fly on the wall to our conversation are probably thinking, how do I find out more about you? What do I get towards this book? Um, where do people find out more? What are the kind of things that you're involved in? How might you be able to talk into their lives in some way? What's Jeffrey sure. Shaw all about? So uh, jeffreyshaw.com, probably the best place to start. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> you know, you'll find everything there. Uh, you know, my podcast, Creative Warriors. I mean, I, I'm as you are, I'm pretty constant in what I believe and what I stand on, which I, you know, one could call a platform, right? Um, which, by the way, speaking of words, we could do a whole show on the word platform. I love the duality of the meaning platform. So what we stand on as speakers, but it's also our platform of values. Like, I love the word platform. <laughs> so, um, you know, that jeffreyshaw.com is, is a representation of my platform, as well as all my social media links, because I'm pretty active there. So that's the best place to find me. Awesome. And I highly recommend the book. It's a great read for anybody that's in business looking to try and get more business and do it from a position of heart. Jeffrey, I have a final question that I ask everybody on the show and it's what's your favorite word and why? Uh, my favorite word is unleashed. And it, it's, it, it was surprising how long I actually did some work with Evan Carmichael. You know, Evan? I don't know Evan. No. Oh my gosh. I'm looking over there because I have his book here. It's uh, your one word is his book. God, you, how could you not know each other? Like considering your, your messages. <laughs> just occurred to me, Evan Carmichael, your one word, like you have to reach out to him. Um, and yeah, it was actually through reading his book and then interviewing him on my podcast, I realized my one word is unleashed. And it's because that truly is what I, I, I want to unleash people from their judgments and assumptions that keep them from being empathetic from others. I want to unleash uh, biz, uh, creative entrepreneurs from have, feeling they have to do business in a typical way. I want them to do businesses in a way that are aligned to their hearts and souls and their creative selves. So yeah, unleashed is my, my one word. Awesome. Awesome. Well, fingers crossed as a result of listening into us today that people are going to go out and unleash more empathy on the world. So Jeffrey Shaw, it's been a privilege. Look forward to catching up with some more drinks and uh, I'll bump into you down in Miami beach, if not somewhere on the road, Jeff, I thanks so. for joining in. Thanks Phil. Bye.